Good morning. The message this morning will fall very closely on the heels of what Bible class was about and some of the comments uh, that started to come up at the end. I'm glad we were running out of time because uh, we were really getting into the meat of today's passage. So that was wonderful how God works. But if you weren't in Bible class, um, to get your thinking going, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 will set the tone, but we will be looking at four passages in the Gospel of Matthew as our examples. But 2 Corinthians 5, 7 ought to be a verse that every born-again believer in the world lives according to, or is their hallmark and their calling. And you say, well, John 3, 16 ought to be that. Well, absolutely, it should but this ought to remind us every single day when we wake up and take for granted life in breath that it's not about the things by which we take in through our eyes and will make then what we would call rational decisions, which we would then obviously say would lead to good conclusions. It's not how we live. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse number 7, parenthetically here actually, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We talked a lot this morning about a blind man whose faith made him whole. The Bible talks a lot about faith. And for the born again believer, this is the means by which justification through Jesus Christ is achieved. I find it actually interesting too that a message like this on the heels of what some would call Reformation Day, the day some 500 years ago Martin Luther left the state church, walked to the castle of Wittenberg, nailed his 95 theses to the door, and basically said, the just shall live by his faith. Quoting Habakkuk 2 verse number 4. And what that faith would look like is that it would be faith in Jesus Christ alone to the honor and glory of God alone and no mortal man. You see, this concept of faith, we take for granted. We use it interchangeably. In fact, our men's Bible study went into a wonderful, detailed uh, deep dive in James chapter 2, which we are not going to touch on today. But it came to a point where how many of us use this word faith just as a meaning of, you know, I have faith. Well, so do I. Well, what is that? Well, it's my faith and you have your faith. It's like what the world says today. It's like you have your truth. I have my truth. Well, whose truth is truth? And if the just shall live according to his faith, well, what faith? And so the Bible puts a big emphasis on this concept of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 would be what we'd call the hall of faith, even giving us the definition of it in verse number one. The gospels go through what it looks like to live by faith. And we're going to spend some time in the gospel of Matthew this morning, because as disciples of the Lord Jesus, who are to walk by faith and not by sight, we are going to see in these four examples that there was a lot of walking by sight and not by faith. And I think we are susceptible to the same today as disciples. It's interesting that even one of the sisters during Bible class used the expression that we're going to focus on this morning, which is little faith, of little faith. It's used four times in the New Testament. Here, and look, I'm no Grecian, but oligopistos, that's the Greek term for of little faith. And Jesus uses it four times. O ye of little faith. We'll read those three portions and one specific time where it's a direct rebuke to Peter. And he says, O thou of little faith, singularly pointing out Peter, you are the one demonstrating little faith. And this is what it would mean today. We would use the word incredulous. Right? And I see some blank stares. We didn't, I've never used the word incredulous. What does that mean? So it's as good as oligopistos. I get it. But of little faith, meaning we trust too little. But the word incredulous actually means this in modern language. We are unwilling to admit or accept what is offered as true. Think about that. Unwilling to admit that what is being offered to you is true. In other words, the preacher comes to you and says today, you can be born again if you believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. And you say, sounds nice. And you go on your way. 
Or like the rich young ruler, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Sell everything you have, give it unto the poor, and come and follow me. And walks away very sorrowfully, for he was very rich. Unwilling to admit and accept that which is true. And I ask you this morning, as I ask myself, am I unwilling to admit and accept to truly live a life that walks by faith and not by sight? For what a man sees, what doth he yet hope for? And yet how many of us are afraid to take a step until we know what the outcome is? It's important, brothers and sisters, those of us who claim 2 Corinthians 5, 7 is our way of life, that we look at these four examples today and understand that it is a rebuke to the disciples. It's not some lesson in the hypothetical. It's a rebuke of a way in which the disciple is choosing to live their life in that moment. O thou of little faith. And so let's personalize that today. Are we those disciples whom Jesus would rebuke because the attitude of our heart that is being demonstrated by the way in which we live is one of little faith? And so Matthew 6, 25, let's look there first. Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 25 starts like this. And we understand that this is nearing the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus says... This after that, you can't serve two masters. He says, Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what shall you put on? Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye, of little faith. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or withal, wherewithal shall we be clothed? And I love how one commentator said today in modern age, or maybe we add one more question, or in which way will we be entertained? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take, therefore, no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And so the first rebuke for those that are demonstrating that of little faith is the constant worry. The worry of tomorrow. What will we have tomorrow? Will we have what we have today? The worry of losing the earthly and forgetting that we are promised so much more than these earthly things. Those things where previously in verse 19 through 21, the heart is found hankering after should they be things that doth the moth corrupts and the rust breaks and the thieves break through and steal for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In other words, your heavenly father, our heavenly father, is able to provide those things. This phrase in this passage here I thought was interesting to look into. In the phrase here, are ye not more value than they? Speaking of the birds of the air. Here's what's interesting about birds, if you've ever observed them, and I'm no orologist, ornologist, doesn't matter. Whatever studies birds, there's a, there's a science for it. But here's what birds don't do, unless you're a baby robin, which we also were able to observe this past spring. Here's what adult birds don't do. They don't sit on the grass in the morning with their mouth open, waiting for the Heavenly Father to put a seed in their mouth. Did you ever notice that? They don't. 
But you know what? The bird is provided for. And the bird does fly and go find twigs and does build a nest and does have families. The bird actually does labor. And you know, the church in Thessalonica was blasted. They were rebuked by the Apostle Paul for choosing to live a faith without works, which James says is what? Death. Not faith versus works. A faith that lives out according to the works that show you believe in the one whom saved you. The church in Thessalonica was waiting for the coming of the Lord. The Apostle Paul says, hey, unless you're willing to work, you don't eat. In other words, don't go up on the hill on the mountaintop and hold your hands up and your head high and sit there until the Lord comes. That is not living by faith. Just like the birds don't sit there with their beaks open, waiting for the Heavenly Father to deposit a seed each morning, their faith and works go together. And brother and sister, for you and I, what does our worry look like each and every day? Do we worry about what we shall eat or what we shall put on? Do we realize that the material things of life, if we place that much value on them, you know what that shows about the, how much value we place on the Heavenly Father? Very little. Very little. Putting all our trust and confidence and hope in the things by which we think we can accomplish shows how little we trust our Heavenly Father. And it shows how little we comprehend the love He has for us. If He has that much love for the birds of the air and the lily of the valley, how much more for us? The great preacher Spurgeon put it like this in this passage for ye of little faith. He says this, he says, little faith is not a little fault for it greatly wrongs the Lord and sadly grieves the fretful mind to think the Lord who clothes the lilies will leave his own children naked is shameful. Oh, little faith, learn better manners, he says. And so for us, do we hold God in such a low view that he can't take care of those earthly things? Do we worry so much? You know where this was truly repudiated? By our very own Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter number 4 as he was taken after 40 days of fasting to be tempted by the devil. And you remember what the first temptation was? You look hungry. Why don't you make this stone into bread so you can eat and be full? And you know what that presupposes? What the evil one comes and tells each of us every day? He wants to think and make us think this way. Our greatest need is physical. If he comes to the Lord Jesus and tempts him with that which is physical, he thinks that's how we think. That our greatest need is physical. And what did Jesus say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. What is our greatest need? Our greatest need is spiritual. And yet, how many of us are taking maybe too much time on the things that are physical? The Apostle Paul later would encourage young Timothy, the elder in Ephesus, in 1 Timothy chapter number 6, he would say this in verses 6 through 8, But godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out and having food and raiment let us be therewith content i've always found it cheeky when somebody would say you never see a u-haul following a hearst you don't bring it with you and you don't bury it with you you know what you do you leave it to the people behind to squabble over it that's what we do Take no worry for the thought of tomorrow. There is enough evil there, the Bible says. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And so the first rebuke to the disciples is one of worry. The second rebuke is found two chapters later in Matthew number 8, if you'd like to flip there. This also was referenced this morning um, in, in Bible class. And thankfully, uh, Brother Kevin kept the course and did not go into an exposition of all of these passages. So here we go. Matthew chapter number 8, verses 23 through 26. 
It may have been the Peter passage, I apologize. But regardless, we'll get to that one too. Matthew 8, 23 through 26. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he said unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? I don't know what type of turmoil you've been in where you were at this point of fearing death itself, where you literally thought, this is it, we are going to die. Now, I was in a, in a, in a, a tempest, maybe not unlike this, I don't know. My brother was there as well, he'll remember it fondly, in a 17-foot Mercury outboard uh, 90 horsepower that ran out of fuel on its way to Pelee Island only to get hit by a storm and barely get in there with the trolling motor. Now, I didn't think we were going to die, but I certainly didn't know how we were going to get back home. But I can only imagine these disciples who are experiencing, and these, look, these are fishermen. I'm no fisherman. I'm along for the ride hoping to catch some fish. That's different. But these are seasoned fishermen who are afraid for their lives on the sea. And yet having, this is, this is probably where the rebuke comes, and having the presence of the Lord on the vessel. Think about that. They had Jesus on the boat with them. And they still had the fear of death. The one who has brought the dead back to life. And they wake him up. Now, there, there, yeah, there, we could go into a lot on, on, on Jesus' ability to, to sleep through what we would consider the storms of life. And yet, you know what this speaks to me when it says, Why are ye so fearful, O ye of little faith? It reminds me of when things are not in my control, the, the external environment around me, and I start to panic a little bit. And, you know, I'll chalk it up to the psychology of fight or flight. And it happens in the most trivial of ways where we panic and we want to just be out of there. We want to, we want to, we take, we choose the flight option. I I guess there's a third option now too, psychologists have determined, which is the freeze. There's the fight, the freeze, or the flight. And sometimes we might just freeze and panic. But I know for myself, it's the flight. I want to run. I don't want to be there. But you know what it is sometimes? And maybe this is true for you. It's not so much the fear of death or perishing, in certain moments, it's the fear of being embarrassed that I put myself in this mess and I don't know how to get it out. And you know what that's called? That's called pride. That's what that is. You ever have that fear of your pride being exposed by the things that are no longer in your control and everybody sees it? And we we can't admit. We refuse to admit. And we're afraid. And instead of recognizing that Jesus is with us, and he takes that fear away, that his perfect love actually casts out fear. And even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what does the Bible say? I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Do we walk with that kind of faith where even the fear of death might be imminent? There is no need to fear. Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul put it so plainly. He says this in 35. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the definition of what it means to truly trust in our Savior. That the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, Jesus said, when the apostles, excuse me, the disciples at that point in John 14, were so panicked that their master is going to Jerusalem and he said, he's, this is the time. This is no bluffing anymore. This is the time you are going to die. And their hearts were troubled. And he says, don't be troubled. I will give unto you the comforter. I will give you the one who will come alongside with you and will be with you and will guide you and will bring you and lead you into all truth. Do we recognize that no one, no man, no system can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? Do we recognize that? Jesus said it plainly in John chapter 10, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father, which gave me them, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. In another passage, Jesus says, don't fear the person that can kill the body, and after that has no more power. But fear the one which not only can kill the body, but can cast the soul into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And brothers and sisters, what, are your, what is the fear that fills you today? What is the fear that so easily besets you? Is it the lack of control in today's environment? Is it feeling like you're being pushed in a way that you don't have control over when the whole while God controls the storm? You see, as much as the disciples may have rowed or put up the sails and put on their, their, their best sailing thinking, do you realize, do I realize that God controls the storm? That God knows exactly what we're going through? Are we willing to live a life that walks by faith even when fear is straight in our faith? Face. Matthew 14 is our next passage, if you'd like to turn there. And this is the uh, passage I had alluded to earlier with, with Peter. This is the one time... Oh, and by the way, this O oh, ye of little faith, this is very interesting as a note for you Bible students. This is the phrase, oligoptisos, that's Jesus is the only one that, that uses this. Nobody else rebukes the disciples or anybody else in Scripture with O oh, ye of little faith. So take that to heart for a moment. Somebody once, a Christian, said it like this very plainly when it comes to trusting God. God is the one that always provides for us and protects us. He summarized it in these three things. He gives us protection. He gives us the direction. But he also gives us the correction. The protection, the direction, and the correction. And when Jesus is rebuking his disciples, that's the correction. But you know what it shows it shows how much he wants to protect us from ourselves and from this evil one. And that he would love to direct our path, that it would continue to follow him. Matthew 14, 22, here we go. The Apostle Peter, we all know this one. Straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway, Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou... Be me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. 
And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. A rebuke of doubt. And dare I say that somewhat there's a growth pattern here in these attitudes of the heart. The moment we start to worry and start thinking that we can't take and provide for ourselves, there becomes this fear within us when some of the, the comforts of life become jeopardized, that maybe we feel like we've built and, and sheltered ourselves from. You know, you look at your 401k these days, don't, but I did. It's down 20% year to date. And that would normally cause someone to panic. Maybe that's retiring next year. But if my hope and my faith is in my 401k, the thing that I thought was, 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 was the right thing to do, and, and, and look at, this, look at this, this shelter that we've provided ourselves, a, a, a falling place when, when, when the toil is over. But I don't control the markets. You don't control them. Does my worry turn to fear? And does my fear here, like what happens to Peter and the disciples on this time on the boat, lead to doubt? Peter wants to follow Jesus. I truly believe he has this, this heart of conviction which is really the beginning of faith, to, to believe that God is who he says he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. How, why do we know that's true? Because Hebrews 11, verse number 6 says that's true. That if, unless you believe God is who he says he is, you can't have saving faith. And in this case, Peter wanted to experience that. Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. Come. Oh, Okay. And so here's why faith is not just simply believing that that's Jesus on the water. Peter actually steps out of the boat. You see the difference? That faith without works is dead. You might be in this assembly this morning and say, yeah, I believe that was Jesus of the New Testament. Yeah, I believe that was Jesus on the water. Yeah, I believe that this church preaches Jesus. You may even say you're saved because you believe those things. And then yet you live a life of worry. You live a life of fear, and you live a life daily doubting that God can truly provide what he said he would. Does our life, by the way we live, demonstrate, like these disciples, little faith? Come on the water, and he does, and then he looks around. And this is our lesson. This is my lesson. When I start to look around me, and I see the things the boisterous wind, the waves crashing over my feet, and yet here I am defying all human logic of standing on water, and I take my eyes off Jesus, we will begin to sink. We will begin to sink. Remember that no man who sets his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. That's useless discipleship. When we look back on the things that we thought we had all together in life, Jesus says, look at me. Focus on me. There will be no doubt. James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8 says, if you lack wisdom, ask of God because he's going to give it to you liberally and he doesn't hold it back. It, the, the King James, or the, yeah, King James says, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So when Jesus commands us to come unto him, and even though it seems like that's not possible, Lord, because I'm in a boat and you're on water, the command is to come unto him. And to walk, doubting nothing. A doubter is one of little faith. 
And lastly, in Matthew chapter 16, we get to our fourth and final, O ye of little faith, rebuke. Again, to the disciples here. And again, I can't really go into a ton this time, but, and Bible classes aren't recorded, but Brother Darren, I'm sure, would be willing to, to break this down for you who taught this Bible class lesson not long ago. But Matthew chapter number 16, let's read it starting at the beginning. The Pharisees also and the Sadducees came, tempting him, desiring that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather for today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas." And he left them and departed. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? Do ye yet not understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that ye do not understand, that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. You see what worry turns into? It turns into a fear of the unknown. It turns into a doubt that Jesus is who he says he is. But then it really turns into shallow thinking. Shallow thinking. We can't think spiritually anymore. Everything is all about the here and now and the physical, and the disciples were no different. In their minds, they are troubled because they forgot bread. And listening to their master, they thought that the leaven of the Pharisees, and the, he must be bringing this up because we forgot our bread. Are we no longer able to think on spiritual things? Do we take the time to meditate on the spiritual things in life? Or are we wrapped up like these disciples who again are rebuked for their little faith for not being able to think beyond the physical? Jesus is warning them here really of the doctrines and the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But like so many of us today, brothers and sisters, if we can't get past the physical, it's hard for us to see what's really happening spiritually, especially in our own lives. Oh, oh, see it in other people's lives, 100%. You see, their, their life is all messed up because of the poor decision-making they have, and, and now they, they're, they're in debt, and, and, they, and that's why they lost their job, because they're lazy, and, and blah, blah, blah. And we start to go down this road of, of casting stones at our brother and sister for their plot or their lot in life because of the poor decision-making. But oh, dare we, dare we search our own heart? Dare we ever look in? And see the spiritual plight because we too are running the same rat's race trying to keep up with the Joneses perhaps and worrying about tomorrow. Four attitudes of the heart on full display by disciples. And this is what we should take heart in brothers and sisters. Disciples are students and learners. That's the, that's the meaning of the word disciple. And if you today say, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, then that puts you in the same position as a student and a learner. And what do students and learners have to go through sometimes? Hard lessons and real life experiences to prove the point. And so the rebuke this morning that we saw of the disciples, and specifically to one disciple in Peter's case, is no different than what we should receive from the Lord but receive it as correction to bring us back to the understanding that it is his protection and his direction that we truly need in life. Juxtapose, O ye of little faith, with this passage in closing. 
back to Matthew chapter number 8. We go back to a little bit to the beginning of the chapter, and we read this in verse number 5. And when Jesus was entered in Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion. And this is important because a centurion was a Roman guard, not a Jew, but a Gentile, one under command from Caesar. There came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Did you know this? I did not know this until I looked this up. But under Roman law, should a centurion have any servant or any party under his command that is a liability? Think about this. A liability. Well, I would think somebody at home who's sick and no longer can serve, if I was this callous, I would think is a liability. But under Roman law, you know what they were able to do? They were able to get rid of them. And then, so this is centurion according to law, could have said, just get him out of here. Sick of the palsy, get him. Get another servant already. And you know what this centurion does? He goes to the healer of all healers, and he says, Lord, my servant lies at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. Think about that. Jesus invites himself to come into your house today. I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Now think about this, the Jew and the Gentile. Most Gentiles recognized that they were unworthy in the presence of the Jewish nation. They understood that they were separated from the Jewish people for a reason. They understood that they were looked at at times as unclean. And he says, I'm not worthy to come under my house. But speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go and he goes. And to another, come and he comes. And to my servant, do this and he do, does that. And this centurion is operating under the Roman model that if Caesar says, we're going, we're going. When the king speaks, we do it. And Jesus hears it and marvels and says unto them that followed. So think about this. The Gentile in their midst is about to be the lesson of what faith looks like. And Jesus looks and turns to his disciples and those that followed him, and he says, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of cheat teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the self-same hour. Great faith. Great faith. Why? Because when the truth was presented to him, there was no vacillation of, well, maybe you're the Lord. Oh, maybe you could heal him. Oh, maybe you are who people say you are. He comes to him and he honors him and calls him Lord. Brothers and sisters, do we call him Lord? One who has authority over our lives. One who said, Bring all your care, bring all your worry, bring all your fear, bring all your doubt, and bring it to me. And I will show you how you don't have to think shallowly anymore, but you can think spiritually by not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. The just shall live by his faith, the Bible says. Do we walk by faith or by sight? Amen.